Hey guys, welcome to Two Months Guitars and Basses. My name is Chris and I'm sitting here with the awesome Mick Thompson. How are you, Mick? Not too bad. Nice. So we, we met two years ago? Mm -hmm. Was it two years ago? Yeah, 2018. Two or three. Yeah. I don't know. So, Time uh, flies. <laughs> we checked out your guitars, uh, but there are still quite a few questions I have and okay. uh, I'd, I'd love to, to ask them now that I have the opportunity. So, first of all, uh, you had you had contact with uh, Mike Shannon, right? Mm -hmm. Jackson. Yep. And uh, how did that go? Like, uh, did you um, guys just start chatting about like a basic model and started modifying it, or did you say like, that's exactly how I want? Can you make it happen? Well, it kind of really started with um, my original Jackson King V that I got in like '92, '93. A custom shop King V that I ordered um, way back. And uh, it's always been my favorite guitar, but I never toured with it or anything. I recorded the first record on it. Oh, oh, um, really? Yep. That in fact, there's a video out there BCs. somewhere where I'm tracking, surfacing, whatever. Oh, and I'm nice. Playing, yeah, I thought those were like BCs. Gunmetal gray, no, nope, oh. dark metallic gunmetal gray. Oh, nice. Jackson King V. Yeah, and uh, so that was my baby. But I like, I never wanted to go on tour with it because we didn't have any security, we didn't have any, like road cases, whatever. It was just like whatever was kind of loose. I'm like, I, I had a three year loan on that fucking thing. Like, wow. I'm not gonna wow. have that stolen yeah. off the back of a truck or something, you know. So, so I, uh, I discovered uh, like the Ibanez 5, 50, 60, 70. Hmm. At the time, you could get them for seriously barely over a hundred dollars. You would find them used where whoever owned it didn't know how to adjust a Floyd tremolo, right? It's a Floyd style tremolo. So the, the bridge would be all jacked up, the pickup height sucks, there's a problem with the electronics, and they're like, this thing's a piece of shit. You know, $100, I'm Get like, rid of it. gimme. About three or four hours of adjusting and fine tuning and stuff, and the thing's just a monster. So wow. I played those early on because it was like one of those things where if I had a $150 guitar, dollar guitar stolen, plus, I mean, they're incredible quality. Yeah. You know, the old Japanese made were killer fucking guitars. Oh, yeah, absolutely. But at the time, the market was down. And uh, so they played great, sounded great, and uh, were plentiful and cheap. And uh, I, my heart wouldn't be broken if one disappeared. Yeah. Um, and so that was kind of that. Uh, and that's why my V never saw the light of day. And then I ended up with a BC Rich deal, and then I ended up going to Ibanez after that, because I always loved the Ibanez. Yeah, yeah. And uh, yeah, so I, I was with them for, I don't know, 12, 13, 14 years, something like that. And uh, so this isn't just the same thing as what my Ibanez was. There's That's a, there's also a lot of, question what I wanted to there's, ask. There's, there's a lot of differences. Yeah. But going back to uh, Mike Shannon and stuff, what we did was I sent them my V. Oh, nice. And because when I ordered it, I spec'd it with, I played a Randy Rhodes model. And it was like an 87, 88 Rhodes. Wow. But during that two-year period, they had a special neck for it. It was Jackson made a really thin neck those couple years. And then they went back to the more standard like shaped neck. And it just so happens that the one that I fell in love with, that I played uh, in Des Moines locally, uh, happened to be a, a, just an oddball neck that they only did for two years, and then they got rid of it. So they didn't even know that until they looked it up. They're like, oh, I forgot, we did this neck, where they actually take and routed the fingerboard to uh, allow for the truss rod, because you couldn't just go so deep with the way they're, they're double expanded oh, truss rods right. were. They couldn't go any deeper in the wood space, and keep yeah. it structurally sound. So they actually went and, and routed you know, down the fingerboard on the back side of it for a little bit of wow. extra clearance, because it was that kind of, it wasn't like wizard thin, like yeah, wizard yeah. Ibanez thin, and not that thin, but really thin, comfortable, playable. And I didn't even know that the neck was only like a two year thing until Mike figured it out. He was like, wow, this is that neck. He's like, I forgot that we ever even made these. So it was really cool. So he's like, oh fuck, I remember this now. So that's what's on my guitars, wow. is uh, that like 87, 88 Randy Rhodes V, USA neck shape Crazy. and it was just what it just it feels like home to me like it's I mean if, if someone has a lot of guitars they'll know what I'm talking about like you have one guitar that just feels right in your hands it's like it's perfect and it's gonna be different for everybody because everybody's looking for something different you know but it just feels everything is absolutely perfect with that guitar and I love the V because I love the way it puts my arm out for oh, really? picking. oh I love it all right yeah because I can pick you know like that and I mean, it's not like I have to fight to pick on a strap type shape. Yeah. If I had my way, I would be playing a V. Okay. All the time. Okay. It's just it's 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 different on stage. Like if if I stood there and played, it'd be great. Yeah. But it's just uh, they kind of the points kind of get in the way for me when I'm moving around a little bit and shit. So it's Might like. Hurt. <laughs> 
I had a, I had few a, people. <laughs> I had a double Rhodes made. It was the first guitar that I had that uh, Mike Shannon made for me, which is the t it's the top it's horn really of a Randy one? Rhodes V, oh. which is way longer than a King V, yeah. and the angle's a little wider. So they basically just mirrored that. So it ends up being this. It's off. Awesome. Sounds killer. <laughs> so much mahogany in this thing. It sounds amazing. Plays great, but it's just unwieldy. Yeah, it is yeah. so big. It's like 19 inches from point to point. <laughs> And it's like this giant thing that like takes up my whole leg. Yeah, and if yeah. I try to put it in like between, it's, yeah. I just fight with it. It's awesome <laughs> if you sit and track with it or something. It's, yeah, it's yeah. amazing. But so I ended up having Nick's that idea and I just went with Soloist, which I've always loved. Um, but For yeah, practical reasons, basically. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. You know, and uh, I mean, it's just much easier to sit and play something like yeah, this, yeah. you know. Uh, so it worked out. So guys, I'm standing here with Mike Smith, uh, Mix Guitar Tech. Yes. And not only that, but we'll come to that in a second. <laughs> uh, let's check out these guitars. Um, we have uh, a couple different guitars here that I can, we can go over. So these are all maple and walnut neck through body with mahogany wings. And this is uh, one of the prototype versions as well as a couple of the other ones. Um, it looks like there's a uh, floating trim here, a Floyd, but it's actually there's nothing there. Guitars are loaded with his signature empty uh, Seymour Duncan pickups. Ebony fretboard, 24 frets, reverse headstock. So this is his A guitar. A in terms of tuning? Drop A. Drop yeah. A, all right. Drop A. So you guys have uh, two tunings? Yeah, like it's a uh, drop, drop B a? and drop A. Yeah, uh, so the drop A for the uh, string gauges, a lot of people ask. Okay. He's using 66, 42, 32, uh, 20, 16, 12, wow. which is kind of heavy, then fairly light. Yeah. And for the drop B guitars, it is uh, 58, 42, 30, 18, 15, 11. Wow. And he's using uh, D'Addario strings. That's what he's been using for okay. so okay. long. Uh, and he's actually using their new XTs, which are their coated strings. Oh, really? Okay. He, he's fallen in love with them. You know, being on a show, these guys are in full mask and everything. They sweat a lot. Yeah. There's a lot yeah. of water but they feel and sound just like the NYXL. Yeah. So uh, exact same guitar, similar spec. Uh, it is a green though. Um, this is actually from a American football team, uh, the Philadelphia Eagles. This is their oh, uh, nice. green on their helmet, which is very, very cool guitar. Right. A little dirty still, have to do the uh, final <laughs> wipe down. <laughs> uh, this is uh, another one. In white, this is another just a standard version. So the black and the white ones are yeah. what his signature uh, guitar that you can buy straight from Jackson are based on. All, right. All the same specs. Uh, this guitar is also in B. We have, uh, as a backup uh, for the drop A guitar, uh, we have one of his Indonesian, uh, the import oh, guitars. Nice. And okay. I'll tell you, these things still play and sound phenomenal. Okay. And these actually have the bridge that he designed with Jackson on another guitar I'll show you over there. So instead of even having the block, uh, like the Floyd does, this is streamlined even more. And this is a fixed bridge. There is nothing on the back. All the same specs, just at a uh, lower price point. And over here is uh, the one of the very first guitars that uh, is now a limited run from right. Jackson, which is the carbon fiber. All so right. all the same specs, his wow. signature bridge. Uh, and this is a beautiful carbon fiber veneer. Yeah, take a look at that. I hope you guys can see it. It's so three-dimensional. And Mick is a huge, he loves carbon fiber. All right. Absolutely loves All right. it. You can um, tell. <laughs> it, it, it. A lot of people actually ask, does it do anything to the sound? No. Yeah. It does yeah. not. It's essentially just an, an aesthetic piece. Yeah. Instead of doing paint, it's just a really cool kind of nice. uh, aesthetic touch that you know he's into. All yeah. right. I've seen a little measuring tool here, yes. gauge measuring. Uh, you've been mentioning the, uh, the setup. Correct, so, so uh, uh, there's not a whole lot of neck relief uh, in the neck itself. Uh, so what we actually do is off the uh, 12th fret, these are measuring just over one millimeter. Seems a little low for a lot of it's people, low, yeah. but uh, it actually is the perfect height for Mick. He has a very percussive right hand. When he plays, it is just it's yeah. a sledgehammer and he's very accurate. He doesn't have a lot of slop in his plane. 
but he also plays very fast. A yeah, lot of yeah. triplets, a yeah, lot yeah. of down picking, so he has to have a low action with that. And it's probably the same low here, around one mil? Yes, it is exactly the same. What's funny is we actually utilize one of his picks. <laughs> <laughs> so at the 15th fret, it basically has to just glide under All right, <laughs> without moving the string. Yeah, yeah. and that's, uh, that's actually Mick's uh, signature pick. These are the uh, Dunlop uh, Max Grip uh, carbon fibers that he developed the grip with Dunlop. Uh, and yeah, these things just, they what? just don't move out of your fingers when you... What a surprise, grab. carbon fiber. <laughs> exactly, <laughs> <Again>. <laughs> more. Let's check out this rack. Okay. Uh, so these are the amplifiers that Mick started using uh, at the very beginning of the album cycle um, when they started recording. This is my company, uh, Omega Ampworks, and this is the Obsidian. So Mick did have a role in the development of this amp. We kind of conferred back and forth on what kind of features um, you know, a real musician wants to see. We already knew what we wanted to do, and he told us a few things. I, we thought, you know, that would be a really cool idea. And this is essentially what we came up with. It's not a signature. All right, okay. But there, may be, close. there may be something in the future. All right, okay, that's um, a nice hint. <laughs> yeah, so... So uh, it's the Obsidian. Yes, this it is has the Obsidian. basically two and a half channels? Correct, yeah, we call it two and a half channels instead of three because it utilizes uh, the same EQ section for the clean and the lead, sorry, the lead and the crunch channel. Yeah, yeah. So you have your clean, your crunch, your lead, you have independent gain controls for the crunch and for the lead. Uh, this is a master volume amp. It also is full, uh, it's MIDI capable, so uh, channel switching and the effects loop are both MIDI controlled, which we have in his rig. Yeah. And essentially with his old rigs, he's always scooped mids quite All a right. bit. He's wow. a death metal guy. All right. He is yeah. a death metal guy. So he loves that scoop mids, nice. that huge bottom end, yeah. the big top end. Um, and this is the first time that he's ever used an amp where he's actually pushing the mids because it's what he says in his words, the mid-range is exactly where he's always wanted it, and it doesn't have the mids that he hates. That's so, a good sign. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. Nice. Uh, it is a more American-based uh, amplifier design. It's not, uh, it's not really British-based, uh, but it's definitely a unique design uh, in a lot of areas. All right. So. Nice. Very nice. So how do you control the amps? So basically, we are using this, uh, this space launch pad here. Wow. Uh, this is a Mastermind GT22 from RJM. Right. RJM. Uh, I do all of mix patch changes uh, for the songs. Uh, some are actually utilizing effects processors. Other times, it's simply just hitting the pedal itself uh, for small parts. There is quite a bit of changing because uh, even if it's not on the album, he likes to add some elements in live. A lot of fuzz pedals, a lot of a lot of really gross sounds. I really want to ask you about. We even have we stuff. even have yeah. one called Gross, gross. and Wretch. Oh, you know, nice. so. <laughs> <laughs> wow. um, but yeah, we do all the switching here, uh, and we can actually go over. So. Uh, this is utilizing the RJM effects gizmo mm -hmm. where all the pedals are running through. Um, and we can actually go down the rack here and explain everything that's going yeah. on. Yeah. So to start off, uh, we're using the Shure Axiant Wireless. This is the top. There's, all right. in my opinion, nothing okay. better. And this system has been absolutely amazing. Wow. Uh, so out of the wireless, we're going to the Peterson Strobo rack, which is pretty much another, can't get any better than that. Uh, so all the control for the wireless packs and the distribution to the amplifier all come from the Radio JX44, which is a very cool unit. You can actually have up to four different outputs for different amplifiers. Uh, you have four packs uh, that can be, you can hit them at any time. Um, makes things a lot easier oh, yeah. for yeah. guitar changes. So essentially the way that the signal flow is going is wireless to the JX44, JX44 to the front of the amplifier. Uh, the amplifier at that point then is going to the Torpedo Live from the speaker output. All right. So the reason we're using this along with an isolation cab is essentially for backup reasons. Yeah. If the cab, if the speaker ever blows, we still have signal no matter what. Right. This also adds another flavor to the front of house because they love to be able to blend. That's what I wanted to ask. Uh, as far as I'm concerned, this is also active, like all yes, the time, it is. right? Yeah. I mean, you have your own IR? We created the IR wow. of the actual speaker cab that we're using. And how does 
an IR that's exactly the same, like the simulation of the same setup you have here, rich in the sound? Like, so, is it like phase things or? Not necessarily. So uh, this one was actually utilizing a different microphone. All right. So uh, the isolation cab, we're using a Biodynamics M160 and we're also using a, uh, a 4050. We wanted something that was a little bit different, but that could still fit perfect in a mix and right. if something happened to the cab. So it's just giving a little bit different mid-range, a little bit different, different flavor. top end. All right. A little bit different flavor, yeah. Okay, exactly. makes a lot of sense. Okay, now um, I got it. <laughs> and from the torpedo, it then goes out to uh, the uh, speaker cab. That is a big ISO cab. <laughs> it is. Uh, he used to use a 1x12 ISO cab uh, back in the day, and they kind of found that a 1x12 is never going to sound the way a 4x12 does, regardless you know, regardless of just having one speaker mic'd up. Yeah. The cab is one of ours. Uh, it's the Omega 4x12, and it is loaded with uh, two of Nick's brand new signature speakers uh, that are being released very shortly okay. from Eminence, right. and then two of our OEM speakers as well okay. that uh, will be in uh, his signature cab that we will be releasing. So it's going to be two of those. So it's going to be two and two. Yep. Okay. He, he absolutely fell in love with the sound, so he wanted kind of that combination. And uh, yeah, it's uh, we're mic'd up with the Biodynamics M160. And then we also have the trusty 4050 right there. Another fantastic nice. mic. Uh, these two units, any old oh, yeah. guitar players will know, these are from mid 90s. Uh, these are the units that Mick used on the first album for some of the tracks like surfacing, prosthetics, and that's the only way you can get those sounds. These things honestly sound more like in between an eight and 16 bit game console than a <laughs> hi-fi. And that's kind of what gives it its, its nice. flavor, its character nice. is that they're, they, they're not good, but they're so good in that same set. So They're very good in not being very good. Exactly, right. and this unit right here is actually what was tracked on the first album. Oh man. So this exact unit. Insane. Yeah, so uh, we're using these currently right now for the set list for surfacing. Uh, earlier, uh, or last year, we were, out, we were doing prosthetics as well. Right. So is it like so, humanizers or harmonizers? Uh, or which? There's a little bit of everything. So right. um, prosthetics has a ring modulator with distortion. So it runs the, the quality internal <laughs> distortion <laughs> into the clean channel of the amp. Nice. And that's kind of how the sound is. And uh, same thing with surfacing is it's using a distortion, a reverb, modulation, uh, uh, envelope filter, wall filter. You name it. So a lot, a lot of, of weird, a lot of weirdness that nice. you can't duplicate. Nice. Uh, okay. From there, uh, the pedals that he's currently using. So everything is being powered uh, by the uh, Chucks DC7. Uh, we have the Zoll noise gate. Uh, great gate. Uh, the plasma pedal. This is one that he is very fond of. Uh, if you don't know it. what these are, love it. Yeah. Take a look at them. That's three and a half thousand volts running through a gas xenon <laughs> tube. It's so cool. And which song does he use? The uh, so right now, uh, the set list, this is actually only g being used as a filler between songs All right. uh, because they've changed the set list a few times okay. over the past year and a half. And right now we don't have a song specifically that's being used for, but we put it in between just to give it a real gross feel before the next song starts. Nice. Uh, after that, we have the plumes pedal. I have this on there because it gets pretty it's bright. Really bright yeah. <laughs> uh, this is actually uh, personally one of my favorite new overdrives. It, it just does so many things so well. Uh, you have it in the, the mid mode. Yes, the it mid mode. There's like the different compressions and gain yeah, levels. Yeah, yeah, and you really get to hear exactly what it does when you put yeah. it in front of a clean amp. Yeah. It can. It's amazing how accurate yeah. it can make. Just that kind of classic broken up yeah. uh, sound. So uh, besides that, we have the bass balls. So a lot of people question what this is. So this is a filter, and it was originally designed for bass guitar. He uses it for a song called Disaster Piece. Oh, nice. It's the only way you can get that really? is by using the bass balls. We've tried the small one. It sounds OK. This one and the old black one made in Russia are the only ones that actually do the sound. Wow. And it's literally one millimeter change either way will <laughs> affect the sound dramatically. Uh, after that, we're using the uh, Super Lurica Fuzz from Seymour Duncan. We use this in All Out Life, as well as uh, uh, Birth of the Cruel uh, on a couple different parts. Nice. Yeah, very, so very cool It's a big fuzz. surprise for me to see fuzz pedals 
He you know. is obsessed with fuzz pedals. Yeah, this I mean, the, nice. the core sound is always the amplifier. Yeah. He never runs a boost in front of the amplifier unless it's a solo part or unless he wants to really a lot have a lot of sustain yeah. ringing out. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, he loves as gross as it can get. He's a big fan of like the <laughs> HM2 heavy metal oh, pedal nice. and all of those. Oh, nice. So from there, we have uh, the Nanolog Orbital Fuzz. Mm. This is a very small company. A lot of, not a lot of people know who they are, but they're doing something really cool. So a lot of people know about silicone and germanium diodes. They're actually using carbon diodes. It's, it's, you got to read about it. It's pretty crazy. Wow. Uh, so we're using this on uh, the song Unsainted. Um, pretty cool, very unique sound, and it's got some pretty cool features on it too. Wow. Uh, we have the Eventide H9, which is another phenomenal piece. Absolutely. Um, reverbs and delays, I mean, it's Eventide. There's, well, that's all you, it's really it's all you have to kind of say. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so we're using this on the end of Before I Forget and the beginning of Eyeless. So from there, we have the Wampler Tumnus, which is another overdrive. Uh, Kind of the same thing as the plumes pedal right now, as far as what it's used for. Pushing the I ambient mean, more saturation, I guess. Uh, yeah, and just different parts. Way down and levels, yeah. sort of. Yeah, it's it can be used for just adding some sustain between songs or for a lead. Um, and then we have the I can't feel my face super fuzz. <laughs> <laughs> it's the best from, name ever. <laughs> yeah, from Dead Effects. Uh, nice. Super small company. I think it's just one guy building these in his house, probably on his kitchen table or in his, awesome. in his bedroom. Uh, you buy them on Reverb, and that is one of mine and Mick's favorite fuzzes as well. Crazy. The thing is, we probably had 150 different pedals in the studio with us when we were uh, when they were tracking the new album. And he was like, "Oh yeah, it's just a portion of what I have." So, <laughs> oh my god, he's, uh, he's definitely oh. big into that's, pedals. That's something new. I, I never knew he was that much into. Oh, pedals. absolutely. Yes. And uh, a lot of times, the more gross, the more obscene and nasty, the better. Uh, that fits the picture. <laughs> yes. Yes. <laughs> like really going for it. Yeah. Absolutely. Nice. All right. Uh, and that's uh, a Rack Mount Crybaby. So, well, this is the uh, RJM Effect Gizmo that was connected to the. Uh, to the mastermind. Uh, yeah, so we use the Crybaby rack wall. This makes total sense for us in the fact that our loom going out front is 150 feet long. You don't want to have 150 feet of signal cable nope. going out there. Uh, so he has two pedals on stage, uh, one on his and one on uh, stage right as well. And uh, what's really cool about it is we can just dial in the sound exactly the way we want it. Uh, there's a boost built in that you know, when you want to use it, if you don't want to use an overdrive, it, it pushes the amp enough, and it's it's just a great unit. So nice. from there, we're using the MIDI Solutions T8, which is basically controlling uh, the MIDI distribution between the amplifiers and the GX700, and uh, eventually we're probably going to go ahead and integrate it into the uh, H9 as well. Nice. All right. Oh, and that's a Furman. Absolutely. <laughs> okay, so I was wondering how, how you guys get your electricity. This is the, uh, the P1800. What's really cool about this one is that it will never drop below 115. And it's, it just, it's quiet, it's stable, and they're, you know, I mean, they're the, there's probably, a reason why they're yeah. the biggest in the yeah. game. Nice. Thank you very much, Mike. Not a Have problem. Have an awesome show. Absolutely. And, uh, see you around. Absolutely. <laughs> A really big fat neck plays like shit and it sounds killer. You know, if you want a really fat sounding stuff in a track or something, and that's another thing that people can do, I mean, if they're afforded the luxury of lots of guitars, is you could get something that tracks incredible yeah, yeah. and sits really perfectly, big, full sound, and then you can play with, I mean, with loud volumes and shitty rooms. I mean, when was the last time a band played? I mean, I mean, yeah. Tonight, we're not yeah. going to have perfect acoustics in right. this fucking, you know. It's roomy, it's, yeah, I guess. Exactly. Yeah. So you, that kind of nuance is lost in a big room. Yeah. So you could play a faster, comfortable neck live, but you could always have a tank for tracking. And that's one thing I like, because I do have a bunch of stuff like that. It's, yeah. The V is great for that. I'm just not a really big mids guy, uh, but they're necessary evil, I guess. Yeah. I, I've yeah. had to make peace with that over the years. <laughs> I'm not scooped like I used to be. Mike I, just mentioned that. Yeah. That's interesting. I used to have a graphic in my effects loop that just sucked all the mids out. In the 90s. It was yeah, great. Yeah, but it was, yeah. you could never fucking really be heard in a mix. HM2. So, yeah. It sounds awesome at home. I still scoop the shit on my stuff at home. But you can't do that. Like on a record, you're just not going to be heard. Um, so sonically, this thing sits where it needs to. I mean, it's just years and years and years and years and years of trial and error and stuff with different materials and finding what works best for me, what I think works best sonically in terms of all the materials that go into it. And then my pickups were tuned with that same wood recipe. So 
I mean, the pickups work with. I mean, it's not that you couldn't play this with an alder body or whatever. Yeah. I mean, I've got I've got these pickups in tons and tons of guitars. Yeah. But I just it's a very known quantity, and obviously every tr every tree grows different. Every every wood guitar oh, yeah. is going to be slightly different than the next. So I don't have two that sound absolutely the same. Sure. Um, but they are pretty consistent. I mean, it's not wild swings either way. A lot of times you don't even notice it live if you're cranked up really loud, yeah, you have sure high gain and no, stuff. No, no. But once you get in the studio, it becomes very obvious. Some guitars are a little dull, some are a little thin, some are a little, and it's like, then you'll have one guitar just stands out and you're like, that's the fucking one. Yeah. You know, so that, it, there always is one of those. Um, in fact, my metallic green one. Oh yeah, I've seen that. That's what I tracked all the, the B songs on oh, the record really? with. Is it just, there's something about just the woods that are in that one guitar. It has everything. It has a really big bottom. It has a nice bright, airy top. It's got a mid that punches and sits nice. just perfect. Sustain for days. I mean, they all have sustain for days, but yeah. it's just, it's a different, like when you're plugged in in the studio, I mean, it's under a microscope. Yeah. You know, sure. so that's when it. Yeah, but these guys feel it. Live, right? yeah, well, exactly. Yeah. And it's, people in the audience might not know, but I mean, as a player, you know, when you're really into it and you dig in, it, like when you have the juice coming back, it's like you want to play more. Exactly. Like it's like a, a feedback loop, like with my white guitar. Yeah, you know, Storm Trooper. Out. Yeah, yep, my Storm Trooper guy that I uh, my USA custom. Like once we come out, I I start uh, I switch to All Out Life is the song I switch to that guitar, and it's just so juicy and awesome. Something like that. and that riff is perfect. Yeah. You know, the start of All Out Life. So it's like it's inspiring. It's fun, and we play it towards the end of the set. You know, so you might be kind of tired and sore, yeah. but it's like you just come back to life because you get that feeling back. Yeah. Like when I really dig in, it gives me a lot back, you know, and, and that's great. I mean, yeah, it's, awesome. it's one of those things that when you get a guitar like that, and you get that feeling, it's it kind of, like I said, it becomes home. Yeah. Like yeah. that's like your baseline. You can have all these other guitars. You can I really like them yeah. and they can sound great, but it's like this one is the one, you know. Awesome. So you went back and forth with Mike uh, while de developing the guitar, or was it like, dude, I know exactly what I want. I want this, you know, a compound radius. I want these wood. I want that. And mostly, okay. uh, but but it's great to to pick his brains because I mean, like he'll go, well, how about if we do it like this? Okay. I'm like, obviously, you're a fucking master. And yeah. I, yeah. You know, I, I play the shit and love it. A legend. But. Yeah. You know, I'm like, so I'm always open to suggestion. Yeah. I'm like, here's what I think. Well, what do you think about this? You're like, yeah, okay, well, I might do this a little different. That you know, sounds... then we're doing it a little different. Wow. I mean, do you have like a few examples still you remember, like, which was like your thing? Like, I really want this to be on the guitar. And what was his idea? Like, yeah, what, what if we do it like this? They're basically little tweaks, or it's a thing in the construction. Um, I was going to do a slightly different radius. Okay. I was going to go a little flatter. Uh, and I ended up going with what they had, what their normal, like compound, compound radius is, yeah. because I mean it's it's fucking awesome. Yeah. It's a little more comfortable down here playing chords and stuff, yeah. and it flattens out. And so as you're up here, any bend still comes out. When you have a really well made neck, yeah. you can do that. Like slamming, I mean, you kind of you can push and pull a neck and whatever. Yeah. Especially like if you're just really into it. I mean, if you're just in practice and shit, you're really fucking into what you're doing. Yeah. You can yeah. push the flat or pull it sharp. Even, yeah. This isn't gonna do that. Wow. You know, so the sustain's great, and this bridge, proprietary bridge that I developed with Jackson, um, it looks like your standard issue kind yeah. of like yeah. low pro Floyd <clears throat> or you know uh, whatever, but yeah, it isn't. And it's it has actually like this, this uh, screw right in the middle, right? Yep. So it's it's sitting on top of the wood. Yeah, it's, it's routed. Right There's yeah. all the wood. It's basically it's just a like a Floyd style hardtail yeah. that Jackson made yeah. for me. Um, so it has all of the adjustability of a Floyd. You, know, you can get your height and, and whatever. And I love dual locking. Yeah. Once you stretch it, lock it down, it's just where it is. Fine tuners is all you ever need. It never goes out of tune. It's never a problem. And I just, I like the way it is. I don't know, I can't prove that it has more sustain, <laughs> but I swear to fuck that it has more sustain. <laughs> but it's just something I've always loved. And I like the feel of it. Yeah. And I've always loved the feel of a Floyd and the tunability, you know, and, and the stability of it and shit. Like once it's fixed, because yeah. I would always fix them. Like since we started touring and I didn't need to go, yeah, you know, yeah. in my bedroom, You're I'm, not, I'm not 14 in my bedroom anymore. Yeah, so, yeah. <laughs> so I started blocking them all off. But yeah. but when you leave all of the wood and build this on purpose like this, it's just so much better. You have all the benefits of yep. having more wood, yep. more sustain, and yep. more contact. More yeah. everything. Yeah. 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 yeah, More sustain, bigger sound. You know, exactly. Yeah, it all plays together. And wow. so I'm super happy with the bridge that they came up with for me. Awesome. And, uh, Yep, and as always, I just run a single volume in a three-way telly style <clears throat> because 
who playing metal ever uses a tone. Yeah, for high gain, it doesn't make it And also, yeah. every time you have something else, you're running signal to ground. Yeah. So even when you have your tone turned all the way up, it's full treble, yeah. but it's still bleeding some shit off. I found, I was just experimenting, like in my late teens, early 20s, I was just soldering some shit together. And I, I soldered my pickup directly to the output. Yeah. And it was just hotter than shit. And I had a volume on the floor. <laughs> it was like uncontrollably. I'm like, holy shit. So that just showed me. That's all in there. Oh my God. <laughs> yeah, no, I'm like, this is all part of the sound. Yeah. But it, it just laid bare and illustrated that yeah. every time you run to a pot, you're just, of yep, you're running a bunch of your signal down. So I started clipping them. Yeah. So, I mean, the knob was there, but I'm like, so when I started doing customs, I'm like, well, why have something there that I don't need? Yeah. You know? I I've, even, I've even thought about getting rid of my neck pickup. Oh, yeah. I mean, wow. I, I don't play them on stage. Oh, really? So I thought, oh, you wow. know, for even more wood in the guitar and whatever, just run a single bridge. And I haven't had one built yet, but I'm, I'm contemplating it. That would make you know? for a really sexy guitar. Well, that's what I thought. I thought about it. maybe even going like direct, like a direct mount pickup with nothing yeah, there. Yeah. But well, the, the great thing about this is it will get you anything. Like the neck pickup, very warm, very musical, great with cleans. I mean, yeah. I love a single coil, so I mean, I would personally probably tap it. Um, you know, if I wanted a Swiss Army guitar, if I had one guitar that I wanted to do everything, yeah. I'd have a coil tap for the yeah. neck. Yeah. Um, but that's the only thing I would do different. I mean, but this is just a very straightforward, it is a metal guitar, but can do anything. Well, no, like, no, it's, actually, it's just just musical, you know. Exactly, that's the word I was uh, thinking about when I tried uh, your pickups first, back like, whatever it was. It was like you have that active kind of very clear sound, but it's not cold. You know what I mean? That, and that was exactly what we were going it's like, for. It has this mojo. That was and, exactly what we were going for. Is I wanted a pickup that lived more in a passive sounding world, oh, yeah. like where there was more harmonic richness across the top, and like you could hit a full voiced chord. Yeah. under high gain yeah. and you could hear everything come out yeah. and it felt nice and big and we ended up with four or five different versions before I got it dialed in exactly part of it was dialing in the low end oh yeah um, because the original, tighter, the original blackout yeah. was kind of big and it, the bottom end bloomed a lot yeah. but I want it really percussive yeah. so yeah. it's not thin at all or no, brash no or, it's the last no, thing I would say plenty, about no, it's it. plenty of, but it's just we, we crafted the low end to where it's you know, yeah. it'll, like, it'll yeah. hit you as opposed yeah. to, I mean, think of if you're sitting in a stoplight and the guy next to you has got rap playing with subs. Yeah. You know, yeah. that big boom with a soft low, like soft bass yeah. or something that was going to, you know, really fast yeah. death metal double bass yeah. on a, you know, like that's what I want. Yeah. I, want I want like kick drum brutal. Wow. You know, like yeah. I want to hear that coming back yeah. and it yeah. works with the pickup. And my amps, like you're talking about with, and these going through my amps, because part of the amp tuning happened with my guitar too. Oh, yeah. So yeah, so the amps, yeah. very nice point. Uh, Omega and Berks, right? Mm -hmm. Wow, big surprise. You were with Rivera for whatever, 12 years? Long time, oh. yeah. And you had your signatures like at least five years, maybe longer, mm, might be mistaken. Not yeah, sure. well, from probably 2006. Pretty long, yeah. Wow, okay. How did I came with Mike? Uh, I met was he your him. tech first or? Nope, nope, I met him. I met him and uh, we started talking about gear and cabinets and stuff and he didn't even have the amp out yet. Like he was, he was in you know early prototype forms. Yeah. And, uh, but he made me a couple single 12 cabinets that just blew away and they were ridiculous. Good guy and uh, he'd been working on the amp and uh, sent me an early version of a proto you know, and I just gave him some feedback, like things that I would like. You know, it's not yeah. my signature, but it would be like, for me, I'd like a little bit more of this and a little right. bit more of whatever. And so it's just input from, it's just another set of years. It's like a, our producer in the studio. Yeah. And he you told know. me uh, that for the first time, you don't scoop the hell out of the end. My mids are actually above. <laughs> yeah, above noon. <laughs> above noon. <laughs> For the first time in my life. How come? Is it the amp or is it the, the combination? Yeah. Or, well, it's, or it's, it's, I mean, it's, it's how everything works. I mean, it's, and you should never set, and there was a problem with the Reveras. If anybody ever played my Revera and they set the knobs, like they were active yeah. tone controls. Most people don't realize that. Oh. So if you set it like you'd set a Marshall or something, like what the fuck is this? Yeah. But we don't set it with your eyes, set it with your ears. Yeah, yeah sure. You know? So it's just about tuning it how you want. And it's like the sound that I get that I like has the mid up that high. Um, and so the settings I have out there now, I mean, it's basically what I recorded the record with. It's pretty much six, six, six out of ten. I get, 
Little, yeah, there's a little what more a surprise. variance in there. <laughs> there's, a, there's a little more variance in there, yeah. but sort of. You know, sort of, yeah. Yeah, it's a good bass line. Yeah. And then, so you can do that with a tube screamer. Yeah. 666, your tube exactly. screamer. And then, and then yeah, and then dial tweaking. from there. Yeah. That's always what I've done. Nice. Uh -huh. do, you, do you and Jim uh, sort of sort out frequencies or, you know, do you go for a more creamy sound or I go for a more, you know, trebly sound or you just do what you do and then see if it fits? Uh, exactly. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's we, and I changed out with the, the cool thing about this. So I tracked the record with the amps, um, but I used 6L6s at the time. I've switched to KT66s. K66, yeah. I got KT66s now, which are fucking What's cool about his amps too is you can put any fucking tube in it you want. Basically, wow. you run the L thirty fours, you can put six. He has bias such like yeah. Well, he's got your ability to adjust the bias with such a wide range that you can pop damn near anything in it. You just need to get the right value, you know, to set yeah you know the yeah. bias yeah. too. So it's all text him like I got some whatever I want to put these in. What should these sit at? He's like you know seventeen point five whatever. I'm like okay, okay cool ding there you go. But I put in the KT sixty sixes TADs. And it was like, holy fucking fuck. It was, <laughs> that was worth two fucks. And a holy in there. It better be yeah. really good. Yeah, it was religious <laughs> and full of fucks. It was a motherfucker that changed it. Wow. Just all this mid range. And you'll hear it tonight yeah. if you stay for the show. And oh, yeah. Absolutely. God. They're huge. Wow. And they're just perfect. And so I've switched to those. Um, and everything is my own signature speaker that has now come out at NAM, uh, Eminence made. Um, I tracked the whole record with it. And so even live tonight, you're gonna hear the same speaker I recorded the record yeah, with. And, and that's like probably 90% of the sound, uh, the time, what you play, like amp, speaker, guitar, that's it? Or do you use pedals a lot? The only time you're, you'll absolutely know if I have a pedal. I don't ever use, an, I don't have an always on overdrive. All right, or, so no tube yeah, screamer kind of. God, no. Okay. I, the only way I can really see anybody needing a tube screamer is if you're running passive pickups. You know what I mean? Yeah. Uh, a lot of times there's enough gain on tap, people just don't realize it. They push a little too far unnecessarily, mm -hmm. and you lose some musicality. Yeah. You get a little too compressed and fizzy and, you know, whatever. And it becomes kind of sterile and lifeless, yeah. buzzy, whatever. Uh, but I find that with passives, I really like a tube screamer kind of yeah. thing going into some amps. Yeah. And my pickups just have it in naturally, so yeah. it's, you know, it, it benefits a little bit time to time. But a lot of times it's lost, like fuzzes. I love great fuzz pedals. Okay. So in the studio, there was a couple, I mean, so we do extra tracks, like to fatten things up. Yeah. And I was playing some Seymour P90s mm. into different fuzzes into a fucking, what, 65 or whatever reissue Super Reverb. Oh, nice. So you got the really clean Fender with the fuzz. That way you're letting the fuzz be the fuzz. Yeah. You know, you're getting a really clean single coil pick. Well, I mean, it's a dirty single coil being yeah. a P90. A lot of mid-range, but, but yeah. still. It's the but same, it, but yeah. it just, it lets the it lets that work, and that's really nice. Um, yeah, these definitely squash a fuzz yeah. out pretty hard, but you get killer sounds with them, too. Oh, absolutely. So I've got a bunch of fuzzes in my rig right now. I've seen your rig. And also, oh, Mike's got some that he likes string because of my switching system. Yeah. He'll go, Liz, what's it sound like if we try this into the plasma? My God, there's some gross uh, sounds there. It's fun because he'll like come up with a new one and be like, check yeah. this one out, and he'll hit it. Like, Jesus, <laughs> whoa! When I thought it couldn't roar anymore, here yeah. it is. And it's like God farting. <laughs> <laughs> that was. Uh, in, fact, I'm a, in fact, I'm gonna have to tell Mike tonight <laughs> that I'm like hit the God fart patch at one of these things. We'll just blow it I'm out. Gonna see so. if he gets your your. Yeah. No. The, yeah. It's the, it's the brown note. Yeah. Yeah. Nice. It's the brown dog. <laughs> oh man, so cool. Thanks a lot for the chat. Jackson made this possible. We will give away this insane guitar. It's Mick's soloist. And Mick has a question. If you answer this question correctly, you will automatically enter this lottery. If you want to check out all the details, basically, how one gets selected, <laughs> just check out the description and video uh, under the video. What is the question? The question would be, um, and it's not related to the guitar. Okay, okay. But it goes back to talking about fuzz pedals. Oh, okay. And the question would have to be, who farted? <laughs> See what you did there. All right, Simple guys. enough. <laughs> who farted? I love it. All right. <laughs> Have fun, uh, good luck, and uh, I'm so looking forward to, to seeing you guys tonight. Cool. And uh, have an awesome tour. Fuck yeah, man. Thank All you right. so much. Thanks so much for having us.
You guys take it easy and uh, we'll see each other very soon. Make sure to check out all the other videos on the channel and subscribe and everything. You know what to do. Bye. <laughs> Thank you, Mike. We always have fun. Absolutely. Mike. That's why I was like, you know what? We need more time. Yeah. Like, yeah it's, I knew it. Because I love, like, once we sit down and, like, get talking about stuff, yeah, then I feel like more, you know, because I hate when it's just, like, really question, answer, question, answer. Yeah.